Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Eric Wagner, and I'm a staff correspondent and government executive. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's webcast, Making Sense of Open Season During a Pandemic, underwritten by Blue Cross Blue Shield. Today, we'll discuss the insurance options available to federal workers and what they need to know to make the best choices for the uncertain year ahead. Before we start, if you experience any technical difficulties, please contact us by chatting with the host listed in the platform chat function. Joining us today are Walt Francis, an author and consultant at Consumers Checkbook, and Aaron Andrews, a benefits officer at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Thank you both for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you. So um, just to start off, um, do you guys want to go through sort of what's different about this year's open season from perhaps previous years? Uh, what kinds of uh, benefits, changes, and enhancements are there and things like that? Uh, sure. Good morning. As we all know, the FEHB program is one of the most comprehensive and largest health insurance programs that offers different kinds of plans for federal employees. This year under the FEHB program, we have uh, approximately 276 FEHB plans for federal employees to choose from. And that does include 18 nationwide plans and a bunch of regional carriers that are located throughout the United States. So for any one federal employee, they're always gonna have the choice of one of those 18 nationwide plans. And depending on where they live, they'll have a handful of regional carriers to choose from as well. There are a few plans that are leaving the FEHB program this year, and if federal employees happen to be enrolled in those plans, they should be receiving a notification in the mail from that particular FEHB carrier so that they'll know to go ahead and jump in and start researching during this year's open season to make a choice on something and into a new plan that they'd like for 2021. Some of the new plan options, oh, Sorry, I should probably backtrack about the increase for 2021. On average, the FEHB plan premiums did increase about 3.9%, and that's about 3% for the government portion and 4.9% for the employee portion. The government pays approximately, and I'm going to use that word approximately because I'm not a math expert, approximately 75% of the total in premium on behalf of the FEHB employee. So these are just some of the things to think about as we're going into open season. Open season is a great time to take a look at not only the plan that you're in, double check the premium. Premiums go up every year. I know that sometimes people get used to just being in one plan, they're happy with it, they don't want to make a change, but it's really important to, to take a look at those premiums. And some of those regional carriers we've got, we're seeing premiums that are going up double and triple digits. So it's something to remain cognizant of. Also, take a look at some of those regional carriers. I know that for, for federal employees, we have a tendency to, if we're happy with something, to kind of continue with it, go with it. But there's a lot of new plans that are coming out every year. I think that there are about 10 or 12 in the FEHB program this year from a health insurance perspective that offer different options for our employees. And there may be something very similar to the plan that you're in that may provide you some premium savings or a lower deductible or something that may, that may meet your needs a little bit more. So that's just what I'm limited to saying, you know, <laughs> the official from a general perspective, but I, I don't know if Walt had any. Well, that was, that was great. Uh, two two COVID related things, just to be, you know, add a little. Uh, first, as uh, we hopefully by now all know, there are, is at least one and I believe two new COVID vaccines that are about to be approved that uh, clearly work very well. Uh, and we're going to be able to start getting immunizations probably in December. Uh, and there are doses already manufactured. So the, the problem won't be is there any vaccine? It'll be getting it to you. Uh, and the, imp the importance of this, among other things, aside from life-saving benefits, is that it's all free, okay, in all FEHB plans. So you don't need to think about that. You just need to worry about where do I, where do I get in the line to get the vaccine? Uh, the other thing, as many know, but some may not have realized, that telehealth is now a major benefit in all FEHB plans. The, the details vary from plan to plan, but the basic idea that you can get uh, using Zoom or some other software, get online with your family doctor or with some other, maybe a specialist 
because you have a new problem and you need some expert advice, you can get either at very low cost or free a direct communication with someone without having to get in the car and schlep all the way over to the doctor's office, which may turn out to be 100 miles away, depending on what doctor it is. So those, but those things we all get. Uh, I think the thing we all need to do, and we need to do it every year, it's not new, is think about our health situation. Uh, everyone in our family, is there anything new or different that may affect which plan or plans is best, are best for us? Um, you need to review the plan you're in. The, one of the best things about the FEHB program are the brochures that OPM requires each plan to prepare. They're usually about 100 pages long, but you don't have to read every page. Uh, they're written in plain English. They're, they're in a common format. So if you want to find out about maternity benefits or chiropractic or something like that, in every brochure, you can simply, if you have them online electronically as a PDF document, and you can get them from the plan, from the OPM website, from the checkbook website, we'll come back to all those things later, uh, you can type in the word, a search word for maternity or chiropractic, go to that page in the brochure and see what the benefit is. Beyond that, there is in every brochure, section two, how the plan changes for next year. You read, it's only a page long, read that page, okay? It's very important. There may be good news for you or bad news and you wouldn't otherwise know what's gonna happen. Uh, there's all, for those who are annuitants, uh, age 65 plus, um, or well, actually at any age, if you have, if you have Medicare and Medicaid, excuse me, Medicare parts A and B, forget Medicaid. If you have Medicare parts A and B or are thinking about getting Medicare parts A and B because you're turning 65, there is a section in every brochure, section nine, how the plan coordinates with Medicare that explains in some detail, and it's different for every plan, what kind of deal you get if you have parts A and B or just part A uh, in plan X, Y, or Z, including the plan you're in, but lots of others. And there's been a lot of good news in that front in the last couple of years, not new this year, but uh, Blue Cross Basic, for example, now pays $600 a year towards your Part B premium, which makes that plan very attractive as an option. Um, let me just, uh, one other general point about comparing plans. Let's say you like the carrier you've got now, but you may not realize that your carrier has multiple plans. Uh, Blue Cross now has four national plans and, uh, and, and, and all, many local plans. Aetna has a half dozen plans. Uh, United has uh, even more plans than a half dozen. Uh, it, Kaiser, if it's in your area, usually offers two or three or four different options. So there's a lot of possibilities out there without even changing your preferred insurance carrier. Um, but it's really important that you spend some time thinking about the plan you're in and looking at at least a few of the many other choices. And we'll get into what some of those are, but you know, it's not it doesn't have to be unpleasant. It could be half an hour of your life. Uh, and the savings you can, checkbook calculates for every plan what you're likely to spend in premium uh, for sure expense and in out-of-pocket expenses, your, your cost sharing in the plan, depending on whether or not your health next year is good, average, or poor, or whether your, I should say, whether your medical costs are low, average, or high. Um, and we find that there are roughly more, there's more than a $2,000 saving that most people can make by switching from a higher cost plan to a lower cost plan, taking into account both the premium and the out-of-pocket expenses. So it's not like there aren't lots of choices that can save you money. Uh, I th one way I like to describe it is if you switch plans, it's like giving yourself a pay raise and uh, over and above the government cost of living increase. So my, real money is involved in making your decision. Um, you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the changes and what's going on in the uh, standard, you know, healthcare plans, but I understand there's been a couple of changes uh, over at FedVIP, the dental and vision plan. And uh, I believe there's also a recent change for next year uh, on FSAs related to the pandemic. Do you guys want to talk about that? 
Sure. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in if you don't yes, mind going first. <laughs> yes, and thank you for pointing that out. There are 10 new FedVIT plans. So that's going to total a, a difference of, or excuse me, a total of 23 different plans that federal employees have to choose from. This year, there are plans under the Federal Vision and Dental Program that are only offered regionally. So again, if you've got a FedVIT plan that you've been enrolled in, either vision or dental, you really like it, check out to see if possibly there's another carrier in your area. They seem to be popping up. They're not as, as many as the FEHB plan and program, but there are, they are getting there and they are expanding their program options. Just a little bit of a difference with the FedVIP for, from a premium perspective, those FedVIP plans are employee pay all programs and the premiums are based on regions. So depending on what region you're in, you can visit benefits.com to explore all of those options and they'll be able to provide you with information on the premium for not only the plan, but the price within your region. Some of the changes for the FSA program, and that is something that came with the CARES Act this year, was the increase of a rollover amount for the healthcare flexible spending account and the limited expense flexible spending account, which is the healthcare FSA that you have if you have a high deductible health plan. Prior to this year, the rollover amount was 500, but that is increasing to $550. And what that means is that if you're enrolled in an FSA plan, a healthcare FSA plan for 2021, either the regular healthcare FSA or the limited expense that's coupled with that high deductible health plan, and you enroll in uh, the FSA plan for 2021, you can roll over up to $550 of unused funds to use in 2021. So it's really a nice option for those folks. I know that we've had a lot of changes with COVID. A lot of doctor's appointments were canceled or postponed. There was a special FSA enrollment period back in July that helped some folks either increase or decrease the amount of that fund. But at this point in time, if you've got some extra funds, you do have to make an election during open season to remain in this FSA plan. So go ahead and do so. And if you do so, you can roll over up to $550 in unused funds. Uh, the dependent care FSA is a little bit different. There's not a rollover option. You do have to enroll every year, but what the dependent care FSA does is it provides you with a grace period. So you actually have up until March 15th of 2021 to incur expenses for your 2020 dependent care FSA funds and until April 30th of next year to make sure that you submit those claims in for reimbursement. So that's also a nice option. So a little bit of difference between the healthcare FSA and the dependent care FSA. FSAs, and this is something that OPM provides information on, is not a really highly utilized program within the federal government. And I know that with the anticipation or the thought that I could put, uh, make an election the year before I need to use it. What if I don't use all my money? We don't wanna lose out on our money. But it is a great way to put some money every pay period in an account that's tax-free. And that money is available on January the 1st of every year. There's a minimum amount to enroll in a healthcare or limited expense care FSA, and that's only $100. And I know that seems like a lot, but if you think about it over 26 pay periods, it's a couple dollars a pay period, and you can gauge how much you'll use throughout the year. And if for some reason you're towards the end of the year, you haven't used that $100, then there are some options that came along with the CARES Act that changed the way that we were allowed to use FSA funds. For example, you can now use FSA funds for feminine products, which is a, a, a big change this year. And you can also go ahead and use them for over-the-counter items that you don't need a prescription for. So again, for all of those rules and regulations, I'm going to direct you to the FSA FES website because that is the source of all of the, the valid information. And that's where we like to send our employees so they hear it directly from the program and the program administrator. Let me just add, because we, we skipped one key point. I think oh. everybody needs to recall. The open season, which ends December 14th, is not just for health plan selection. It's also for FedVIP plan selection separate from your health plan and for setting up your FSA account separate from your health plan. So you have three things you need to think about doing between now and December 14. Uh, and I would add for those on Medicare, there is a Medicare open season uh, that very few feds need to worry about, but we may get into that later. 
there's some angles there. That ends December 7th. So, um, you know, there, time is flying and you should pay a lot of attention to your deadlines. D trying to do this stuff on the last day is not, not, not the smartest thing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the websites. Uh, OPM has a really fine, for the federal government especially, <laughs> website uh, that helps you in plan selection. Uh, all, any and all plans in your zip code and for your family size and pay system can be compared side by side. Uh, and I think it's a, a must use feature. Uh, unless you use the checkbook website, which has all the OPM features, okay? They're both very comprehensive, very easy to use. And uh, we have the, the one additional feature is we actually estimate for your family how much you're likely to be out of pocket, including premium in every plan that you're eligible for. Now, what's the third kind of website that I urge you on is the plan, individual plan websites, okay, which have lots of usually easy to read and understand or see pictorial information about their benefits. They're touting what they're proudest of, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, those are advertising websites, so to speak, but they, they will often give you information. Oh, I didn't know about that. For, let me give you a simple example. You may or may not need a hearing aid, okay, but you might not have even thought about which plans offer it, okay, and you might run across that information if you went to the Blue Cross or some other website. Uh, you'd, by the way, you'd find it on a checkbook website too, I don't want to, but all three categories, the plan websites, the OPM website, and the checkbook website let you click to the brochure for any plan you're interested in, and I cannot overemphasize how Simple it is to just download that PDF file onto your computer, takes a second, uh, use it as to search for changes for this year, for those hearing aids you may really need and what the deal is on hearing aids or any of the other plan benefits that matter to you. Um, and as mentioned already, uh, we there are separate websites for the FedVIP plans uh, and for setting up your flexible spending account. So you've got three visits to make to OPM, okay? Uh, in addition to your checkbook visit and your plan website visit. Um, so um, one of the things OPM announced this year was that uh, you know the premium increase on average next year will be about 4.9%. And now that means, you know, some plans you're going to see no increase or very little increase and other plans, like you said, are going to have, you know, double digit or higher increases. Um, so I guess uh, if for feds who may be currently in one of those latter plans that are increasing a lot, um, can you go through sort of uh, how you can evaluate uh, plans that you're thinking about going into? Uh, especially, you know, I know that I am guilty of not wanting to change to a plan that I don't, you know, necessarily, I'm not used to, you know, I might not be used to, you know, a high deductible with an HSA or something like that. So I might okay, at least are... initially be kind of scared of it. Can you talk about some of the trade-offs in some of these plan types? Yeah, a couple of key points. One is there's really two aspects of the premium. One is how much did it change? But the other is how much was it to begin with, okay? Because there may be a very expensive plan whose premium didn't go up very much. A lot of people are stuck in plans like that and that may, and they are not the best deals, okay? Two plans this year whose premiums went up zero are the FEP Blue Plan, uh, and this, these are national plans open to everybody, and the uh, GIHA Elevate Plan. Some, there are many people who probably even know those two plans exist. They are recently new offerings for Blue Cross and GIHA. They are very, very good plans in terms of benefits. Their premiums were low, and when, when you go up zero, they've stayed low. So those are good choices to consider for anyone who's even willing to look at more than one plan just to see how much you could save. And I obviously, all these are good plans in terms of, of coverage and out-of-pocket costs to you for doctor visits and hospital visits but some of them have premiums that are double yep. or more the premiums of others. So we're talking thousands of dollars differences 
and uh, it really pays to pay attention. You can see the premium side by side on either the OPM website or the checkbook website. So there's no excuse not for flipping there and seeing, oh, of the 20 plans or 25 plans available in my region of the country, um, hey, holy cow, here's some that only cost for a single person, say, $1,500 a year, and here's others that cost $4,000 a year. And the benefits aren't really all that different. So this is worth spending five or 10 minutes just looking at possibilities. Yeah, and I'd like to just tag on to that, Well, you know, from an agency perspective, we don't, and are, are limited to getting into the details of those FEHB plans and how to save money. We urge all federal employees to go to the OPM website. Uh, they do have a great comparison tool, which you've mentioned a couple of times. They do premium comparisons. You can pull up a map of the United States, click on your state, find which plan options are available for you. And just a reminder, open season for health insurance, vision and dental and FSA feds is an annual event. So if perhaps you wanna dive in, change a little bit for 2021, it's either a good fit or it's a little too tight or it's a little too loose. Remember, you can always do it again next year. So nothing set in stone. We have open seasons every year. Plus there's numerous qualifying life events that would allow you to make a change during the year as well. Thank you. Let me just add, for this is the government executive uh, production, federal agencies pay about, on average, 72% of the premium cost of every plan, okay? So when an employee makes a frugal plan choice, the agency saves money. So it behooves all federal managers to be sure that their employees do pay attention to open season and have a chance at least to make to make prudent frugal choices. So everybody has an interest in uh, in your making a good plan selection, starting with you, the enrollee, but including even your agency. Great. So I know that uh, you know there are you know, two million federal workers out there, and they run the gamut in terms of. Uh, background, what the, where they are in their career, I guess, can you guys talk about some of the, you know, what different factors that different federal employees might need to take into consideration, you know, whether they be new employees or, uh, you know, maybe folks close to retirement or even if they're already annuitants, but they're not, you know, not quite yet in the Medicare range. I'll take a shot at a couple of groups and then please, Aaron, jump in. Um, if you are young and healthy, uh, and actually if you're older and not so healthy, but in the simplest case, young and healthy, you should definitely consider looking at the high deductible plans. And they have something called health savings accounts. They are different than FSAs that we've already talked about. They are not annual set asides in the same way that it's not use or lose money. A health savings account is tax preferred, a savings account that's you own it, if you're in one of the plans that provides it, it's paid out of the premium, okay? It got, the money goes into your account tax-free. You can invest it in whatever investments you choose to make and it grows tax-free over time. And when you take it out and use it for healthcare, it comes out tax-free. I like to call it an IRA on steroids. It's really a great deal and if you're, it's not the best deal for people that have a high recurring every year, high prescription drug expense, because you don't want, you know, that high, there's a high deductible in those plans. But most people should consider looking at a high deductible plan. One other example, uh, and that, by the way, there's extra contributions you can make to that health savings account when you're over age 50. So it is not a one age fits all system. Uh, one other example, and then I'll, you know, is HMOs. Let's say you're new hire or you're new to town, you've been transferred. You don't have a doctor in, in, in the new city you're in. Um, HMOs pre-screen and pre-select big panels of doctors and preferred provider organizations, which is what most plans are, do that as well. But HMOs specialize in doing that. So there's a lot of people in, in Washington, DC, the most popular plan among new federal hires are the Kaiser actually three plans, the Kaiser plans, because you go to the clinic, you know you're gonna get a, a good help from, from people who were selected to provide that to you, and you don't have to worry about 
you don't really, nobody lets their fingers walk to the yellow pages anymore, but you know, it saves you a lot of search problems in locating good doctors. Uh, I'm probably missing some good examples. Uh, so jump in, Erin, whenever you're ready. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, as I've mentioned before, from an agency perspective, we kind of treat everyone the same. We want everyone to take a look at those FEHB plans and programs in their areas. Double check the premiums every year. If you're in one of those plans that is ending, you're going to get something in the mail. Please review your plan options. Um, and another interesting intricacy of the FEHB program that we haven't talked about is that if you are in a terminating plan and you don't make a positive election during open season, and a positive election can be either cancellation or a plan change, agencies are required to put you in the lowest nationwide cost plan. And for 2021, that is the GIHA Elevate plan. So if for some reason your plan is terminating, then we do have to put you in that plan if you don't make a positive election for 2021. There are some plans that are also reducing service areas. So if you happen to be in one of those areas, you'll get notified as well. And if you don't make a positive election during open season, we agencies do have to move you into whatever's left that is offered by that particular carrier in your area. So those are things to think about. Another piece of information that was included in the OPM highlights booklet, and you touched on this earlier, Walt, and it's a question we get a lot is, if I'm retiring or I'm close to retirement, I need to enroll in Medicare, should I? And then how will my FEHB plan coordinate with that? From an agency perspective, you know, we send everyone to the OPM website. They've got a great area on their site that talks about Medicare, the A's, B's, the Advantage, and D, and how they coordinate with Medicare plans and FEHB plans, rather as well as the, you mentioned in the FEHB brochures, there's a lot of information about how they coordinate together. But we do get that question a lot. And I think one of the more interesting pieces of the highlight document that I actually noticed this year, and I don't know why I didn't notice it in years prior, but it talks and gives specific examples of the FEHB carriers that may waive and uh, Medicare Part B deductible or waive some co-pays and things like that for enrollees so they can coordinate and, and save cost in that way. If you're interested in that information, the OPM plan comparison tool that's on their website, when you pull up those plans in your area and you're looking at them and you select the plans to compare them more specifically, it, you are given the information about how it coordinates with Medicare and whether or not they waive deductibles or co-pays. So I know that's a point of interest for a lot of our folks who are, who are nearing retirement or are in retirement. Now, Aaron, you, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, there's always a lot of talk in open season about, you know, what the big national carriers are doing with, you know, Blue Cross and Aetna and the like. But you, you also mentioned, you know, something that Fed should maybe take a look at are the various regional plans in their area. I guess, can you talk a little bit more about uh, these plans and sort of how people can uh, sort of research them? Sure, of course. I know I've mentioned the OPM website ad nauseum today, but I'm going to head and going to mention it again. If you log on to the OPM website and you go to healthcare, there's a bar at the top with different titles and you go to insurance and then scroll down to healthcare and it will pop up a map of the United States. And I think that that's a great visual for those of us. And there are ways to enter your zip code, but I like the map. I always send people to the map because you can click right on your state. And as soon as you do that, the plans that are available in that state are listed for you. And that will, of course, the top ones will be the nationwide carriers. But if you scroll on down, there's numerous health maintenance organizations or HMOs and consumer driven health plans and high deductible health plans that are available as well. And some of those health plans that are state specific may mirror these nationwide plans and have a, a cheaper premium. You know, just for example, I've seen some of the regional carriers, uh, for example, in the state of Minnesota that have similar benefit levels to some of these nationwide plans and the premiums are half the price. I know that sometimes we have a tendency once we're enrolled not to double check and take a look around because we're comfortable with what we have. But unfortunately, if premiums do increase for your particular plan a lot. A lot of times people don't notice that until the first pay paycheck in January. 
And in January, we've definitely surpassed open season and that opportunity to do our research and kind of pick something new. And I'll mention it again, open season is an annual event. So if for some reason you're doing your research on these plans in this area and you didn't quite like what you chose, you can always pick next year. What I do tell people is if they're looking for a new plan, is if you already have a doctor, do you like your doctor? Are you in a treatment? You wanna see, you know, number one, is that doctor gonna take these new plans? I think that's a safe way to start personally. And that's what I do tell employees who ask me questions about, well, what's the best plan? What's the best plan for me? And that's subjective. Everybody's different. Everybody has different families. All families come in different shapes and sizes. So what's good for me is not gonna be good for you necessarily. So I say, always start on a personal level. Do you have healthcare that you're currently enrolled in? what kind of insurance is that healthcare provider going to, going to offer in 2021? Or you, you don't wanna choose an insurance plan that may not have that same relationship with your current provider. And again, if you don't have one, then you know, possibly wanna take a little bit more of a risk with it in knowing that next year you can always change back. It's just for a year. It isn't set in stone, well, it's set in stone for a year technically, but the option is there for the future to make a change if you'd like. Well, that reminds me of another homework assignment uh, for open season. Uh, checking, turn this around a little bit. You have a doctor you want to keep. You, th you don't know for sure your doctor is going to stay in the plan you're in next come January 1st. So it's really important to call your physician's office and say, what plan or plans is Doc Sawbones going to be in next year? Um, and uh, you may have a, a good news or bad news, and it may help steer your plan choice search. So that's something to put to your to-do list. Remember, go back, you've got to look at the brochure. How does the plan change? I won't go through the, the whole list, but do include checking about the availability of any physicians that matter to you. Uh, the same thing applies to dentists. The big saving for the dental plans is not that they pay, you know, all the cost of your annual dental tooth cleaning and checkup, and maybe a third of the costs of the really expensive things, it is that there is a, a plan network rate, discount rate that you get for all the plans in the network. Um, and, and by the way, of the national plans, many do allow you to go out of network, but you're always better off financially with a network physician. So again, physician choice, dentist choice matter a lot. One of the features that the, that the checkbook uh, tool gives to people in the DC area, we can't do it for the whole, whole country yet, but we actually do know which plans every physician in the metro area is in. And when you use our, our tool uh, and you see a list of all the, what you could do is enter a physician name or several physician names, and you'll immediately see a list of which plans that physician or those physicians are in. So. The plan, the, the webs and every plan has on its website a way to check both physician network and we haven't talked about drugs much, but you know, which drugs are in the plan formulary. So there are things you need to do. And again, I'm trying to, you know, be on the plan website, the OPM website, the checkbook website, they each have their particular strengths and virtues, but you do need to do, and hopefully all of us who are seeing this show. We're at home, most of us, uh, <laughs> quarantined more or less. Uh, that, if you can see this show, uh, you're able to do a little plan searching online so easily at any of those places. So spend some time and think about your choices. Great, uh, I, you know, you talk, we're just talking about uh you know, spending some time thinking about your choices. Uh, we've talked a lot about the OPM website already as a, as a nice tool for people to be able to compare uh, plans and things like that. Um, what other tools are out there to really, uh, you know, help guide the choice? I know, uh, Walt, you have one at Consumer's Checkbook, so. We have, to my fairly certain knowledge, the only tool other than the OPM tool that's, that's a broad, you know, compare all the plans, et cetera. Uh, and, and we really do very much, I mean, Aaron went through a list of all the OPM plan feature, uh, tool features, and I felt like saying, well, we offer all those too. Let me just say, we have a broad tool that gives lots, does a lot of things very well. Some 
and you may or may not prefer our tool to OPMs or vice versa. It almost doesn't matter. You better be using one or both. Uh, the other thing, some of the plan websites themselves compare options. And in particular, they often compare options of their, for their own plans. So if you go to the Blue Cross website, you're going to find Blue Cross comparing its own plans side by side and telling you the strengths and weaknesses of each relative to the others. So that could be very helpful information uh, in making a plan choice. And all the major carriers do that uh, for at least their own plans. They normally don't talk about anybody else's plan because OPM rules don't let them, you know, denigrate other, other plans. But that, so, the, so the plan websites really are a useful tool. Well, and to tack on to that, Walt, this year due to COVID, we've seen a, a decrease, if none, of any sort of in-person in open season fair. So a lot of carriers are hosting online events. The information is advertised to agencies. I know here at VA, we've got an internal website where we post the information for employees or HR practitioners to access and release to their their federal employees who may want to log in. They can ask questions to carrier representatives, and it gives them a different way of, of doing business in today's times. Great. Um, and then I guess um, just to circle back, you know, you, you mentioned all of these things are going electronically. Um, I guess we should talk a little bit more about uh, sort of the the increase in the use of telehealth, uh, you know, both more broadly and among FEHB plans. I know that's been a big that had already been a big uh, point of emphasis for OPM in the past several years, and it's only become more uh, crucial now. I think, let me jump in and uh, say there, there are two kinds of telehealth that the plans offer, uh, and, they, and they vary a little bit in detail, but one type A is, hey, have a visit with your physician uh, online, okay, you know, and, and a lot can be done just in that conversation without necessarily a physical hands-on checkup. Uh, so that's sort of category one. Category two is most of the plans also offer a, not with your physician, but with their own panel of telehealth specialist physicians. Uh, and you, you go in and, and say, I really need advice on my arthritis. Okay, can you find me someone to talk to, a doctor to talk to about arthritis? And they will put you in touch by telehealth uh, with a physician who is a real arthritis expert. So, Either of those two methods of using telehealth are, are, can be very valuable to all of us, not just those who are, don't want to go out and catch the virus, but you know, it's their conveniences. Uh, Medicare changed its reimbursement rules this year uh, to allow, they were, those rules really disfavored telehealth, okay? Um, they now favor telehealth and I don't think they're gonna turn back. So I think this is the wave of the future for all health insurance in the United States. Uh, there's another barrier out there, which is a lot of states have laws that say you, a physician can only practice in our state and has to be licensed in our state, or you can't, or the, you know, or you can't charge for, for, for work you do in our state. We need to break some of those laws open a little more widely, particularly for people in rural areas where you may not have a good choice of nearby physicians, but you really want a good arthritis doctor and it may turn out that the, the nearest big city is in the state next door. So I think we will see other reforms in that area over time, but for now and, pro and for probably staying uh, either free or at reduced cost, we're gonna have telehealth type A or type B available in our health insurance plans. And that's great. That's interesting, Walt. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you know, as an agency official, I, I am limited to regurgitating what OPM has <laughs> shared with us regarding FEHB carriers and that they strongly encourage all FEHB carriers to utilize telehealth to provide services to our employees. But something interesting that I haven't mentioned yet is that 
federal employees can actually enroll in FEHB plans, either based on the zip code of where they live or where they work. So in larger agencies like the Department of Veterans Affairs, where we're located across the country, if someone happens to be working in a different zip code than they actually live, they can actually enroll in a plan in either where they work or where they live. But just to be cognizant about the plans and the limitations from a zip code perspective. But that is an allowance that's out there. I, I thought of that when you were talking about, you know, finding uh, someone for arthritis in a different state. That's that's a big deal. I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, it's really I didn't important. know that. It, it's important in D.C. where there's a multi-state jurisdiction and some people live in West Virginia or Pennsylvania and work in D.C. It's important in the Cincinnati area, which is three states, okay, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. Uh, and it's important in, around the New York City region. So that's a very important point, especially, I think, uh, you know, in, in places like Nebraska, where you know, Omaha is on the border, <laughs> one end of the state. If you live in the other end of the state, what's what's your best option? And maybe I some Iowa. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I guess uh, just one last question. Any last tips for feds who are trying to figure this all out uh, over the next month or so? Yeah. I'll get, well, one for sure. For heaven's sakes, open the brochure, go online, find it one way or the other. It'll take you a whole 30 seconds, okay, or minute, and look at the brochure and the, how, what for next year, the 2021 brochure. And just, you could even just flip through it electronically. For example, we've talked a lot about telehealth. Well, search on the word telehealth. You will find what the plan deal is, and you'll probably like it, okay? So it doesn't have to be things that you need. It could be anything that matters to you. There is a page in every plan or pages called un unofficial benefits that are not part of the OPM contract. Um, and that those pages are where they show the wellness benefits, many of which pay cash for, for doing things like going to the gym or just, or literally just taking an over online exam, okay? asking if you, you know, do you know your weight and things like that. Uh, you can get paid 50 or 100 bucks for spending 10 minutes doing that. Uh, a lot of plans offer unofficial dental benefits. Um, little known secret, your plan's official dental page may say uh, no dental benefit except after accidents, but the unofficial benefits page, which are things the plan promises but are not part of the contract with OPM, may say, oh, and by the way, we give you at our participating dentist a free annual checkup. So for heaven's sakes, spend a little time with your plan brochure while thinking about your family's health situation. And just to tack on to that, I would encourage everyone as a federal employee to kind of take power behind your options and your choices for next year. There's a lot of tools at our fingertips. Uh, access your leave and earnings statement. Know what FEHB plan you're in. Know what premium is there. I know we look at our leave and earnings statement for the leave. How much leave? Where can I go this year? But also some great information on there is, are you enrolled in a flexible spending account? What's your FEHB plan, the premium? And as, as well as your FedVIT plan and premium. We also have access to your electronic official personnel folder that has all of the documents in there that you need to take a look at your enrollment history with FEHB. Your, in, your enrollment history with FedVIP and FSA FEDS, again, they're third-party websites where you would enroll, so that information is housed elsewhere. So just for focusing on FEHB for a second, that information is in your electronic official personnel folder. So take a look at that. Know what plan you're in. That's a, a big question I get every year during open season. Well, I don't know what plan I'm in. How do I find that out? Your leave and earnings statement has it. Your electronic official personnel folder has it. Another big area or time, and I mentioned this earlier, is that first pay period in January after the premiums change. It's really challenging for agencies to, to justify allowing a belated open season election when there's been a premium change that's either double or triple digits because our employees didn't take the time to at least just check the premiums for 2021. You're going to be doing yourselves a favor. And again, overall, the employee Average went up about 4.9%, but in some of those regional carriers, we are seeing double and triple increases. So take a hold of that, you know, be your own advocate, especially when it comes to these plans and programs and for your future for next year. 
Great. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Uh, thank you, Walt and Aaron, for such a great conversation. At this time, I would like to turn the program over to George Jackson, Director of Events at Government Executive Media Group for a custom session hosted by our underwriter, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Thank you, Eric, and thank you to all of our panelists. I'm George Jackson, Director of Events at Government Executive Media Group, and I'm excited to continue today's program, Making Sense of Open Season During a Pandemic. Joining me now, Bill Breskin, Senior Vice President of Government Programs, David Yoder, Vice President of Member Care and Benefits, and Kathleen Proctor, Managing Director of Member Benefits, all at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Bill, start us off here. Explain the role of Blue Cross and Blue Shield Service Benefit Plan in the FEHB program. Sure. <clears throat> Be glad to. Thank you, George. I appreciate it. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, Federal Employee Program, or the official name that you mentioned, the Service Benefit Plan, uh, has been in the program since its inception. The program started in 1960 to provide health insurance to federal employees as well as those that have retired from the federal government and were entitled to health insurance. And we've been in it the whole time. So we've played a central role in offering our health insurance products uh, to the federal workforce for all those years. And for several of these years, we've also been the largest carrier uh, in that we have the highest enrollment and the most number of people have chosen our products over the other products that are available in this marketplace. So 2020, challenging year, obviously. How did you address those challenges for enrollees? Sure. Um, you know, I think it was a combination of two things. On one hand, we wanted to make sure they knew we were there uh, to address any of their issues related to treatment, and most importantly, to eliminate that worry that they might have that anything they needed to do with respect to treatment uh, was covered or not covered. And the second thing is to get out of the way, to make sure there weren't any barriers or weren't any obstacles to their uh, receiving treatment. So immediately upon the real deepening of the uh, pandemic and the realization that we'd be in this for the long haul and a lot of people would be affected in early March, we took the lead in the FEHB and waived any deductibles, coinsurances, any barriers to people seeking treatment for COVID to make sure they knew we just want them to get treatment and to get better. We don't want them to worry about anything else. And so we did that. The other thing we did is we did extensive amount of reach out and continue to do so, both with members as well as our local Blue Cross Blue Shield companies who are close to the members to make sure they have everything they need in order to be sure that the best information uh, and the best courses for treatment are available to all of them. So let's add a layer of complexity to that, Bill. We don't know when the pandemic will end. What should enrollees look for as they choose their health plan? Well, I think the most important thing to look for, particularly in a time like this where there is so much uncertainty, is reliability and coverage. So I think our reliability, our commitment to this program, to the federal government, to its workforce, over 60 years speaks for itself as far as being there and always going to be there for them. So I would say reliability is very important. And then coverage. And there's two elements of coverage. What's the most comprehensive? and expansive coverage to cover anything that could arise in relation not only to this pandemic, but just your normal things that arise, um, which are still going on and are still occurring even with the pandemic. Uh, and then of course, the other aspect of coverage is your network, is your, are your doctors, your specialists, are the hospitals that you rely on, are they in the network? We're proud to say we have the largest and most comprehensive network in the FEHBP. And so we think we offer that, but that's critically important, no matter which product you select. So let's talk about some of those plans themselves. David, has COVID-19 impacted or changed any of the benefits or offerings? You know, we, we did not make a lot of changes in our benefits uh, this year, primarily because of COVID. Uh, you know, we, we have a very good suite of benefits, as Bill uh, mentioned. 
uh, and we didn't feel the need to change that other than some of the changes Bill had mentioned around COVID of, you know, making sure that our members get the care they need. They don't have to worry about co-pays, deductibles, anything like that. They don't have to worry about that billing. Uh, you know, we did open up on our telemedicine side. Uh, we already had a telemedicine vendor. We did actually open it up so that local providers could also give uh, or deliver telemedicine visits and care virtually where appropriate. So that was one of the bigger changes we made this year, and that's actually going to go into next year and will become a permanent change for our benefits uh, because we think that, that we really want to make sure the members are able to access their care wherever they may be uh, if they're not comfortable going to the doctor's office, if they're not comfortable in any of those locations. When possible, they can get those visits virtually uh, and still see their physician and get the care they need. What about mobile app options? Sure, you know, we, we continue to have our uh, mobile app available. Um, it's gone through some uh, uh, revamps and revisions and uh, has a lot more information on it. We've got our uh, doctor finder on there as well as um, uh, some of the, uh, the benefit uh, templates that are there so members know what their benefits are and uh, uh, has a very robust uh, formulary when it comes to drug coverage so that members can look up virtually if they're in a doctor's office, if they're sitting in a doctor wants to prescribe a medication, they can look up very quickly, find out whether it's on the formulary or not, and make sure that they can get the most cost-effective cost medication. So Kathleen, we've talked about, you know, some of the ways that BCBS is navigating this virtual world. Talk about some of the key benefit changes in 2021. Okay, so, uh, you know, just kind of continuing on the theme of um, stability, that was really what we wanted to focus on uh, this year because of the COVID pandemic. So we did not make a lot of benefit changes for 2021. Um, nothing really impactful. David already mentioned our new telemedicine benefit, which we're very excited about because that will enable members to see their network provider, their primary care physician, specialists, uh, remotely, um, as long as those providers um, have that capability um, and follow their applicable state laws. So it, it will vary um, across the country as far as what the state laws are in regards to that once the pandemic has, has passed. Um, otherwise, um, made a couple of tricks for, for basic option members. We raised the copay for emergency room and accidental injury um, visits by $50. Um, we always make changes each year to our formularies, so we did that for all three products. This year, the changes we made were had very low impact in terms of the number of members affected. Um, it was around 30,000 total members, and we have 5.4 million members. So any member who was impacted by a drug being removed from our formulary will receive um, a letter from us, as will their physician, letting them know of the formulary change and what they need to do, what their alternative drugs are, or if they need to stay on that drug that's being removed, what they can do to get that approved to continue to get that drug. Um, for standard and basic option members, we also did raise some of our co-pays on our specialty drugs. Those are our tier four and five medications, but again, the number of members taking those specialty drugs is very low, so it doesn't impact a lot, a lot of members. And the, the increase was about $15 to $40 uh, increase on those specialty drugs. So, uh, you know, not a, a large increase. So let's stay with you for a moment here, Kathleen. Can you dig into some of the wellness programs, some of the resources that you offer? Absolutely. So the, the best place for our members to start is definitely with our website, which is fecblue.org, because from there you can link to everything I'm about to talk about. Um, we do also have a um, call center. It's 800-411-BLUE, which is easy to remember. Um, so if you go to, if you call that uh, web, um, 411 blue number, they'll be able to assist you with open season questions, et cetera. But, Back to fbcblue.org, we have an open season microsite, so you can access the new brochures there, um, FAQs, summaries of benefits. We also have um, a great tool called Ask Blue. So we do have three products that we sell to the federal employees. Um, we have the standard option, basic option, and FEC Blue Focus. So sometimes members were like, well, which one is best for me or which should I choose? So the Ask Blue tool helps members um, decide that by answering some questions about how they use healthcare. 
um, and then it gives them sort of an answer at the end, you know, based on what you've told us, this would be the best product for you. Um, we also have, and you can link to this again through fpblue.org, um, for the standard and basic option members, um, they get a My Blue Wellness card. And it's a credit card um, and they earn money on that card by doing various activities like taking the blue health assessment um, they get fifty dollars on their card we also have the online health coach tools so things like stress management which we probably all need right about now um, because of this pandemic uh, weight loss um, and there's some disease specific uh, coach modules they can go through um, if they complete those, they can earn additional money on their card, and they can use that card to pay for their co-pays, um, deductibles, et cetera, so qualified medical expenses. Um, for our FEP Blue Focus members, we have a great incentive connected to getting your annual physical. If you get your annual physical, we automatically say, hey, we see you've completed that physical. Now you can go to this um, website to choose your reward. And for those members, their rewards are either a four-month gym membership through um, Fitness Your Way. Um, they also have a choice of molecular fitness. You take a cheek swab, and it gives you a personalized diet and exercise program. Then there's Sun Basket, where they can get two weeks of meals, three meals each week, or a Fitbit. So those are some of our great uh, wellness tools for our members. A lot of tools there. Uh, David, we've talked a little bit about how federal employees can access this open season information and resources. Let's switch gears to FedBit. Tell me about Blue Cross and Blue Shield's dental and vision-based offerings. Sure. You know, it's been a, a big year for us in FedBIP. Um, we went through a recontracting recontract, process with OPM and uh, we were awarded uh, additional five years, uh, or I'm sorry, seven years for those contracts. So we're continuing to offer that. We are one of the nationwide carriers when it comes to our dental and vision products um, and have been uh, for the past, uh, depending on the product, either a uh, uh, seven to 10 years for that. So we continue to be a big player within that. We've actually had a name change this year. Um, so we used to be uh, FEP Blue Dental and FEP Blue Vision. We are now going by Blue Cross Blue Shield or BCBS uh, FEP Dental and BCBS FEP Vision. Um, so, uh, you know, the military rolled into those programs a few years ago. And we wanted to make sure that uh, we, we acknowledged and then they knew who we were. We were a, a name, a household name in the, uh, the FedBIP world for a long time for FEP members. But we welcome in now the, uh, the uh, military members as well and uh, have done a lot of work there. We've uh, actually reinvigorated <clears throat> our websites. Um, so we know our new websites are BCBS FEP Vision and BCBS FEP Dental. Uh, have quite a bit of information on there as well. And then we actually did launch uh, applications, our new apps uh, for phones uh, that has uh, the provider finders on there, as well as uh, summaries of benefits and things like that. So members can very quickly see what their benefits are when they're in a provider's office, if they have some question about that, uh, as opposed to uh, making a call into uh, uh, the uh, customer service areas. We have made uh, a few changes for and enhancements. These are all enhancements for our uh, dental and vision products. <clears throat> we um, uh, did actually uh, have no rate increases for both products uh, because in um, dental we have rating regions. We did switch a few rating regions so members may see a slight change in their premiums, but there was no overall uh, increase in premiums uh, for this uh, upcoming year. So for if a member is in the same re rating region, they have no increases in their co-pays or I'm sorry, their premiums. Um, on the uh, dental side, we still have standard and basic option or standard and high option, sorry, uh, for those products. Uh, for the standard option, we did remove the waiting period for orthodontia. And um, we also increased the lifetime max to $2,500 family and $1,500 uh, for an individual. On the vision side, um, same thing, we have standard and high options there as well. Uh, we did do some benefit changes there. We increased our frame frequency to annual. Uh, before you had to wait to get a frame every two years. We did change that so you can get a frame covered under the program every year um, now going forward on standard option. And we did increase that frame allowance to $140. So uh, that should cover the vast majority of frames that folks need to get uh, underneath the program and on a yearly basis. And we did uh, put a, a small copay on lenses um, for some of the more high-tech lenses. So some of the blue light 
contact lenses, some of the uh, more exotic uh, things that folks may need, uh, they can get those. They just have a little bit of a copay on those. And then in the high option, we did increase our frame allowance to $200, and that's to all providers. Before, we had uh, they were just limited to vision works. Now you're able to get that $200 frame allowance at all of the participating providers that are in our network. So it's been a really busy year for us. Yeah, certainly. Uh, Bill, you know, about a minute or less here, tie a bow on this for us. Anything we missed? I don't think so. I, you know, I, the great thing is, is I've got people who really know this stuff and David and uh, Kathleen are just a couple examples. But, you know, I think the only thing I'd mention is the passion that I personally have towards making sure the member understands two things. One, how to maximize the benefits that are available to them under any of the products or services that we provide under uh, um, FEHPP or FedBed. Uh, and then the second piece is that they understand how health insurance works and how the healthcare system works. One of the things I'm most excited about is at the beginning of the year, we're gonna offer a, um, a digital healthcare cost advisor, which is gonna be able to provide members not only what their premium is gonna be every year, but what are those expenses that they're going to incur under each health plan in terms of those things that are co-payments, deductibles, benefits that may not be covered under each, so that they can really do a financial comparison. And most importantly, they can do financial planning as they think about how much they're going to spend throughout the year. So we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep making sure our members know as much as they can about how it works and how to use their benefits, because we think if they know that, they're going to want us more and to be blunt, they're going to be have better outcomes, which is what it's really all about. So we're very excited about uh, the new year. Um, we continue under this uh, pandemic, but we feel like, you know, there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and we're happy to take that journey with our members. Well, Bill, David, Kathleen, thank you so much for all of your insights. Obviously an important year for health. We are out of time today. This event was made possible with the support of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. For our audience, ton of great information here. This was recorded and it will be available on demand. So please get that link, share this valuable information with your colleagues. For the Government Executive Media Group, I'm George Jackson.